Hi, I'm Ramesh Gunasekara, and I'm going to read from my novel, Suncatcher. Suncatcher is the story of two boys, G and Cairo, who, as the first line of the book puts it, are on the brink of a friendship that would alter the course of their lives. I'm going to read a section about Cairo's parents. The black framed spectacles my father wore for reading were narrow at the bridge and thick at the sides. Balanced precariously on his flat nose, the plastic arms often acted as blinkers, helping him to focus on the serious business of form. Twice a week, he would have the opportunity, before my mother came home, to fold his race paper into a small rectangle and mark it with crosses and circles, juggling the bookies' odds against the five-and-a-half-hour time difference between Colombo and Goodwood or Kempton Park. Then, tucking his pencil behind one ear, he'd call Siripala and hand him a clutch of green rupee notes and the scrap of paper where he had written the time of the race and the names of the horses and send him to place the bet. The day after I met Jay, my mother came home early, soon after Siripala had disappeared. My father had settled down to the rest of his newspaper, unaware of her frustrations at the radio station where she worked or the transformation in my life. He smoothed the damp paper to try and stiffen the headlines. She noticed the yellow pencil lodged behind his ear. You're not betting again, are you? Now? No, not now. Where's Siripala? He peered over his thick spectacles. Phil was here a minute ago. I couldn't help but admire my father's ability to wriggle out of a corner. But she zeroed in. You haven't sent him to the bucket shop again, have you? Aren't they all shut down? New law, no. Isn't that what enforcement is meant to do? A foolish legal aspiration of the morally demented. They can ban racing here in Colombo, my dear, but you know, even this government can't stop horses running in England. You're betting on what? English races? We have the radio, no? So time to turn the tables. They are the jockeys and we wear the top hats now. The age of imperialism is over. He chortled and clicked his big toe with his second in a kind of raspy salute the way normal people snap their fingers. If you form a club, you see, dearie, you can do whatever the heck you like. The next day, my father, obscured by another screen of newsprint, flicked a finger at an item in the international section. I see your Beatles have made a film, he said to me. The idea that popular music had become news both irritated and intrigued him but he must have hoped it might provide a lure. What's the use? Everything comes here two years after everywhere else in the world. He sees the opportunity. You see, son, this is the problem of the economic relationship we have with the capitalist world. England? Yes, the Labour Party might get in by a whisker at the next election there, in England. But Harold Wilson's economic programme is not real socialism. It's up to us. In the underdeveloped world, the deliberately underdeveloped world, to fight for justice everywhere, including in poor England. He folded his newspaper, discreetly hiding the race sheet inside, as he zigzagged from one bee in his bonnet to another. A car honked outside, alarming house sparrows. My mother hurried in and clattered up to the room. My father swiftly shoved his betting slips and pencil into the drawer of the bureau and picked up the Ceylon Radio Times. When she popped back, she announced grimly, The school problem is going to get a lot worse. Come and put a new plan today. Her voice faded. It's shambolic. He chose a mild rebuke over commiseration. Why doesn't your radio have a proper political debate on air instead of poetry for pleasure every week? 
she did not rise to it. So I've arranged for a new tuition master for Cairo. She turned to me. You, you really must do better in your class, Tess, or it'll be a real mess. You're a big boy now. Time to get serious. Thank you.